Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see you. Let's turn to uh, chapter 12 of uh, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. And we'll begin with just reading uh, a few verses. But I want you to keep your Bibles open to Hebrews because I want to uh, look at several texts in Hebrews. Can you hear me all right? Is this a... Can everybody, I, I don't seem to be hearing very well. Should I use this maybe? maybe? Okay. I'll just use this microphone up here. Everybody hear me okay now? Okay. Let's uh, begin in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And we'll read through uh, uh, verse 2. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, the imagery that's presented here is that there is a race going on, and uh, there are a lot of people sort of in the stadium looking on at the race. And I think that is uh, in reference to all of those folks mentioned in the previous chapter, chapter 11, all of those great men and women of faith who have already completed their leg of the race and now they're cheering on those Christians who are still running their race. And the author is saying you need to focus here on the finish line. Fix your eyes on Jesus who is the author of our salvation. Now this word fix uh, as in the focusing of your eyes literally is from a Greek word that means turn away from to. And it really means to not get distracted. Now I'm sure here in Canada you have great men and women who run track. When I was in high school I ran track just to stay in shape for football season. And my coach used to have me run, you know, cross country in order to uh, stay in physical shape so I could play football in the fall. And he would have us, though, run races and I would run the mile. And he would always uh, caution me. He would say, Guy, now I don't want you looking up in the stands and uh, to see who's sitting next to your girlfriend. I just don't want you doing that, that distracts you. And I don't want you to look behind you, turn your head, look behind you at the other runners to see what they were doing. Well, he didn't have to worry about that because all of the runners were in front of me. I could see exactly what they were doing. But what he was saying is you need to focus on the finish line and not be distracted by the things going on around you. And that's what the Hebrews author is, is wanting for these Christians. He's saying you need to focus on the finish line. Now he uses the word author referring to Jesus. And that word author can be translated by other English terms. One is the origin or source or even pioneer. But my favorite term is the English word trailblazer. And that presents a concept to me that I think the Hebrews writer wants us all to see. Jesus is our trailblazer. He's gone ahead of us, cleared the trail, and he now stands at the end of the trail, encouraging us to come on. Go over to chapter 2, if you would, Hebrews chapter 2, and look at, the, at verse 10. Here's the only other place in the New Testament where this word is found. In verse 10, he says, For it was fitting for him, that's God the Father, 
for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Now in this passage, we have that word author again, which means trailblazer. And we have the idea of what God has been up to since day one when he created the heavens and earth. Here is the purpose of our existence. Here is the reason why God created in the first place. He wants to bring many sons to glory. And he has planned to do that, bring about our salvation through his own son, who is the author or the trailblazer of our salvation. Now go to chapter 6 and look at the last verse of chapter 6. Well, let's look at verse 19 and 20. He says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now that word forerunner, it's not the same term as author, but it has the same kind of connotation. A forerunner is someone who runs ahead, who uh, goes in front of everyone else. And so Jesus has run the race before us. He's like our trailblazer. He's gone ahead of us and blazed the trail, cleared the trail, and he has crossed the finish line. He has reached the goal which is eternity. He is beyond the veil. And now he is there encouraging all of us who are still on the trail to not give up, to not quit, and to come on and follow him to eternity. Now, why would this writer write something like that? And the answer, I think, has to do with the condition of the Christians that originally received this letter. These are people who are about to quit. These are people who are about to throw up their hands and say, what's the use? Now I want you to look with me at several texts that give an indication of their circumstances. Go back to chapter two, uh, beginning at verse one, and let's just read a few verses. He says, for this reason, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels, he's talking about the old covenant. If the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense, how shall we, that is Christians, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation. And so apparently these people, these early Christians that are receiving this letter are neglecting their salvation. And so they're becoming rather apathetic in their Christianity. Go back to chapter six and drop down, or go back to verse four of chapter six, where he has a very severe warning to these Christians. He says, for in the case of those who have once been enlightened, he's talking about those who have come to the gospel. They have been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify them uh, to themselves the Son of God and put him to shame or open shame. He's warning them that if you reject everything that God has sent to bring you into a relationship with him and then you have fallen away from that, you turn your back on all of that, God isn't going to send anything else to try to entice you to be one of his people. And so there's nothing, nothing available for you. I see, thank you. <laughs> 
All right. I can get more mobile now. Can you hear me all right with this? <clears throat> or is this loud enough for you? Okay, good. Where was I before I so rudely interrupted myself? Um, so he's warning them that if you turn your back on the only means of salvation that God has given you, and you fall away, there's nothing. You can never come to repentance because there's nothing that God will send that will entice you to change your ways. Now, go to chapter 5, chapter 5, and uh, begin reading with me at verse 11. He says, concerning him, he's talking about Melchizedek and how Christ resembles Melchizedek. He's saying, concerning him, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Now, we understand what it means to be dull of hearing. It's when you men talk to your wives and you don't hear a word she says. That's dull of hearing. And so here are people that are getting spiritually dull of hearing. They don't want to hear anymore what the preacher might have to say. Verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. He's saying, folks, you are not growing spiritually. By this time, you should be teachers, but instead you're just babes and you have to keep eating baby food. You're not prepared for the solid food that grown-ups ought to be eating. So we're looking at some people who are dull of hearing. They're, we're looking at people who are neglecting their salvation. We're looking at people who are not growing spiritually. Go to chapter 13. 13. Verse 7, and here he calls upon the readers, remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. That word result is literally in the Greek, the word end. And he's talking about those who led these people to the Lord. They are now dead. And gone. And he's saying you need to look to their lives, consider how they left this world, the end of their life, and you need to imitate their faith. He's very concerned about these people. Go back to chapter 10 now. Chapter 10, verse 23. He says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near some of the people in this congregation have quit coming to church and it's because of their sluggishness, their apathy, they're not growing in spiritually in their relationship with the Lord. And so they just quit coming to church. And the others that are still hanging in, they're discouraged. Do you ever feel discouragement when people are no longer attending that used to attend maybe years ago? And they've just gone back into the world and they're not really faithful to the Lord any longer. And so these people that are receiving this letter 
are very discouraged. And they have been persecuted. Look at chapter 10, verse 32. The writer says, But remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. So since day one, they have endured persecution and uh, the opposition of the world, and apparently that is continuing on, but these Christians are sort of saying, we've had it up to here, and they're almost just ready to let go and turn their backs on Christianity and the Lord and the salvation that he has promised them. And so the writer says, here's what you need to do. You need to fix your eyes <clears throat> on Jesus, the trailblazer. He's saying that Jesus has already walked the trail that you're on. Jesus has endured all of the sufferings that you have endured. But Jesus has completed the trip. He's crossed the finish line. And he's now there encouraging us, don't give up, but keep on keeping on. So don't be distracted by what's going on around you, but rather focus on the finish line where Jesus stands there encouraging. Now, whenever I read the book of Hebrews, I have this vision, this imagery that the writer is trying to put across. And it's sort of like in the States where I'm from, the old pioneers that settled our country. They started in wagon trains that began in Independence, Missouri, and went west either to California or to Oregon to settle the country that I live in. And in those old wagon trains that the people moving across our nation, I tell you, it was very, very difficult going. A lot of times the people would have to walk by the, the wagon that was loaded with all of their furniture and they would walk all of those thousands of miles to the destination. It was hard. And so the hardships of the journey would sometimes discourage these pilgrims and these pioneers. Sometimes uh, it would be uh, they'd run out of water or they'd run out of food, or the wagon trains would be attacked by hostiles. And it would be so discouraging, some of those people would say, we're not going any further. This is it. We're going to stop right here, or we're going to turn around and go back to where we came. And so they never reached the goal of California or Oregon because they were discouraged by the hardships of the journey. And sometimes as Christians, life can get kind of tough, can't it? People uh, don't warm up to us when we take a firm stand against the sin that's in the world. And so it can be hard for us to keep on moving in the direction of eternity simply because of the persecution that we might receive. Well, there are other things that bother, bothered uh, the wagon trains. And, and the writer says here in chapter 12, let's go back to chapter 12 in verse 3. When you think about the hardships of your life, look what the writer says in verse 3. For consider him, that's Jesus, our trailblazer, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. To grow weary and lose heart means to spiritually get discouraged to the extent that you just quit. And so he's saying you need to focus on Jesus and remember how difficult 
He had it. I don't care how bad it might get for you as a Christian. I don't care if the whole world and your whole family turns against you. You will never have it as bad as our Lord Jesus had it. And so he's saying you need to receive encouragement by focusing, fixing your eyes on Jesus, our trailblazer. He's at the end of the trail. He's crossed the finish line. And now he's encouraging you to come on. Now another thing that those people, those pioneers in the wagon trains faced in those old days is what I would call doubt. Sometimes, you know, they would come to an area where there would be a town and a city slicker would come out to the wagon train and suggest to them that they needed to settle down right there in their town because he wanted their money, you know, and, um, and also to build up their community. And he would say something like, you know, they talk to you about the green valleys in California and over there in Oregon. All of that is really untrue. It's just a pipe dream. And so he would cause disbelief and doubt in the minds of some of those pioneers and they would say to the wagon master we're not going any further we're going to stay right here because you've lied to us and so they never reached the destination that they set out to reach because of doubt well in hebrews chapter 3 the writer talks about that in chapter 3 and verse 4 in chapter 3 he talks about the the children of Israel who were headed toward the promised land. And if you remember the story in the Old Testament, when they were led by Moses to Kadesh Barnea and they set up camp, Moses sent 12 spies into the promised land and they came back and 10 of those spies said, oh, it's a great land, but those people are like giants. And they have fortified cities. And we're like grasshoppers in their sight. And how did the people respond to that? They began to doubt the word of God, didn't they? And they began to disbelieve Moses. And they're basically saying, we cannot take that land. And so we're not going any further than here. And so it was because of doubt and disbelief that they wouldn't go in and take the land. In chapter 4, verse 1, the writer says, Therefore let us fear, that is Christians, lest while a promise remains of entering his rest, talking about the eternal rest God has promised us, any one of you should seem to have come short of it. For indeed we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. It is because of doubt that they didn't reach their goal. And so the writer is saying, some of you are being discouraged because you no longer believe and you have doubt. And so you need to refocus your attention to the Lord Jesus and to his word. Now, I believe that when you and I became Christians, we became pilgrims. We became pioneers moving towards an ultimate land that God has promised us. And so we put on our backpack and we head down the trail, the trail that Jesus blazed before us. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some obstacles on the trail. And I call these insurmountable obstacles. But Jesus is our trailblazer. And he went ahead of us. And he took those obstacles. They were like boulders on the trail. He broke them into pieces and push the pieces aside so that we could have a clear trail all the way to eternity. Now let me give you three insurmountable obstacles. Number one is death. 
death. And of course, if you uh, know anything about the old wagon trains that moved across America towards California and Oregon, settling our land, you would know that many of those people struggled uh, to survive. Sickness would, and plague would run rampant through the wagon trains, and a lot of people died, and they never reached the promised land. We have the same situation as Christians. Look at chapter 2, where the writer in verses 14 and 15 talks about the fear of death. He said, since then the children, that's us, share in flesh and blood, he himself, that's Jesus, likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Now what he's talking about here, folks, is that Jesus became a human being and he experienced everything that we experience, even death. And he did that to deliver us from the fear of death. Now the writer is writing to people, to Christians, who are being persecuted and who have fear of dying. In the early centuries, in first century especially, when the Romans began to persecute the Christians, a Roman soldier could pull out his sword and he could stick it to your throat and he would say, you either say, Hail Caesar, or you say, Hail Christ. That is, you're either giving your allegiance to Christ or to Caesar. And if you said, Hail Caesar, he would let you live. If you said, Hail Christ, he would run the sword on through. And sometimes he might not put it to your throat, he might put it to your son's throat, or your daughter's throat, or your wife's throat. And he would tell you to give allegiance to Caesar or to Christ. Now, folks, when you're faced with that, it is that fear of death that might cause you to turn your back on Christ and give up the journey. And so what the writer is saying, that's an obstacle that stood in our path. The fear of death might have hindered us from coming to God and crossing the finish line. But Jesus is our trailblazer and he broke up that boulder that blocked the way and pushed those things to the side. So we have clear path all the way to eternity. Now another obstacle that I consider to be insurmountable was the law. The law of Moses made great demands upon people and if you and I have to be judged on the basis of keeping law, we will never make it as being righteous people. Because just one violation of law makes you a law breaker. And so Jesus, recognizing that, took that boulder of law, broke it into pieces and pushed it to the side so that we'd have a clear trail. Now look at chapter 8 where the writer deals with this problem of law. In verse 6 he says, But now he, that's Christ, has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant, that's the law, had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he says, and now he quotes from Jeremiah chapter 31 in verses 8 through 12. 
And in that text, Jeremiah, or God through the prophet Jeremiah, is saying that a time is coming when he would bring to an end the first covenant or the law. And then in verse 13, as he concludes, he says this, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. What he's saying there, folks, is that when Jesus came, he became the mediator of a brand new covenant and removed the old law. And that was predicted by Jeremiah. And so that boulder that blocked our path, Jesus has broken into pieces and pushed to the side. Now a third boulder or obstacle that's insurmountable is sin. If I have to stand before God and answer for my sins, he's not going to let me cross the finish line into eternity. And so sin is an obstacle in my being in a relationship with God. It hinders my relationship with God. And so our trailblazer going ahead of us broke that boulder into pieces. Go to chapter 9 and go all the way down to verse 24 in chapter 9. Listen to what the writer says. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, listen to this, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He's saying that Jesus is now in heaven and what's he doing there? He's there for us. He is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty, of the one who sits at the center of the universe, the creator of the universe, the judge of the universe, and he's in a position to do us good. He could whisper a word in our behalf, in the ear of God, the creator. And then the next verse, verse 25, nor was it that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood, not his own. That's in accordance with the old covenant. Verse 26, otherwise he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. This passage says that Jesus has done away with the sin problem. Under the law, when you sinned, you were condemned. But now there is grace for our sin. And so he has dealt with the problem, the weakness of humanity in dealing with the, the problem of sin. It was like a boulder blocking our way to God, but the trailblazer has broken all of that up and pushed it to the side. But here's a problem that I have seen in all of my years of preaching and being a Christian. When we are baptized and we put on our backpack and we start our pilgrimage down the trail towards eternity, sometimes we come to the, where those boulders have been broken uh, apart and pushed aside and we'll reach down and pick up some of those stones and we carry them with us. Like the fear of death. I've known people who would compromise their faith because they feared not death, just losing friends. And it's not until we overcome that fear that we will stand firm and stay on the trail for the Lord. And I believe the resurrection is a great trail marker to encourage us to keep on keeping on. Sometimes we come to that boulder of law that Jesus has removed and we pick up pieces and put them in our backpack 
And so some churches like to make rules and regulations that weigh people down. Rules like you got to use this one version of the Bible. You cannot use any other version. If you use any other version, you can't make it. And so I see uh, in your backpack that you don't have that version. Here's one for you, and it's a big one. If I put it in your backpack. How many communion cups do you have there? Oh, you've got multiple. You can only have one communion. And it's a big one. Let me put it in your backpack. And we make law after law that God never intended. And we weigh people down until they are weary of carrying the load. And we come to that boulder of sin. And we reach down and hold on to pieces of that. Some people think that they can bring any sin with them that they committed and lived in when they were outside of Christ. And other people think that, well, God can never forgive me. And so they carry the burden of guilt with them. And it's so heavy and it weighs them down. And finally they said, I cannot go any further. God will never accept me anyway. What I'm trying to say here, folks, is maybe we ought to lighten the load. Mm -hmm. And maybe we ought to fill our backpacks with things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul says is the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Those are the things that we need to help us to walk the way and to complete our trip. You know, some Christians have been on the trail longer than I've been on the trail. And I look up to them and I admire them for their faithfulness. And they look back to me as I'm coming up the trail and they're moving up the trail. And they see me struggling with something, you know, in my life. And they said, Guy, you know, I've been on the trail longer than you have. And, and I've crossed that piece of territory. I know how you can get over that, how you can get around that. Here, let me give you a hand. And so they're reaching down to me and I reach up to them and take their hand. And they help me over the rough parts of the trail. And so I'm holding on to the hand of those who are ahead of me on the trail. And I look back and there's somebody on the trail that hasn't been on as long as I have. And they're struggling with some aspect of living the Christian life. And so I say to them, hey brother, I know what you're going through. I've been through that before. Let me show you how to get over that. And I reach down to give them a hand and they reach up to grab my hand. And so they're holding on to my hand and I'm holding on to your hand. And there's this whole line of pilgrims mm -hmm. all the way on the trail to eternity. And at the end of the trail is the Lord Jesus, our trailblazer, who blazed the trail ahead of us. And he's just reaching down and pulling us in across the finish line one by one. Jesus is saying, lighten your load. He said this, come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's be encouraging of one another. Focusing on Jesus and let's all cross the finish line into the glory that God has prepared for us. Well, my time is up. Thank you for your attention.